Hello, welcome to another episode of Craft Chocolate TV. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. For the last few years, I've been going to a lot of trade shows and food shows in order to try and grow our distribution. That means, uh, say, a food show in Canada, one in San Francisco, one in Germany. And what I'm learning from this is that most people don't make their own stuff. It's co-packed. And so this episode is about co-packing. And I don't want this to come across as a negative thing. It's just the way that it's done because it's done efficiently at scale and that's how you make things more affordable. So we went to Whole Foods and we bought pretty much one bar of everything that was available. And the truth of the matter is very few of it is made by who you think it is. Most of it is made by a few different companies scattered around the world that make everybody's chocolate. And like I just said, it doesn't work this way just for chocolate. If you get potato chips, it's like that. If you get cookies, it's like that. So most of the time, one co-packer makes it for many different brands that we're all very familiar with. Now, there's different layers to this. A lot of the time, what somebody will do is, if I want to come up with my own brand, I will then find a co-packer, they will then make it into chocolate using the beans that I want, maybe, and then send it to a, another facility that gets the bars molded. This could happen at the same place or it can happen at two different places. So this would be two different sets of co-packers. And then I would have, say, a friend who is a distributor and could get it into every single Whole Foods nationally. A lot of the time, that's how it works. Or you could just buy a lot of Belgian chocolate, which we're gonna come back to this point. You could buy a lot of Belgian chocolate from a company like Calibo, have a 40 foot container show up to you regularly, and then your facility could then turn it into chocolate bars with your label on it. So these are the two ways that you see it done all the time. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that transparency is not a virtue of this industry. And let's go through some of these. Whole Foods, they certainly don't make their own chocolate. Let's take a look at the ingredient list. It says, uh, well, in the United States, you don't even have to say who made it for you. I think in Europe you do. But it just says either, you know, made for Whole Foods, um, Choco Love. I'm actually, I, I like these guys. I'm friends with one of the guys who's running the company. They're, they're buying Calibo chocolate and they bring it over to Colorado and they turn it into uh, their bars and they add flavors most of the time. Endangered species, same way. It also doesn't say who made it. Um, Alter Eco, another one that's really big. They also, I think it says made in Switzerland, so at least they give you some information there. That's more transparent. Divine, same thing. Lilies, um, manufactured for lilies in Boulder, Colorado. So there's very little information. I find this misleading. This is another brand that's gotten really big. This guy's mission, what, he did a, a video, a documentary where he went to West Africa and exposed a lot of the child slavery issues that are deeply ingrained in this industry. And he then wanted to have a bigger impact and have a farther reach by starting his own brand. And I think for a while, one of the lines he used was almost slave-free chocolate because it's so hard to trace and these big companies are so far removed from the actual source where they're buying it from. Like if you're in Switzerland, you're not exactly close to the farmer in Cote d'Ivoire. And so that makes the communication difficult with many different parties in between doing the, uh, their role. And so he wrote on his bars for a while, almost slave free. And that was eye opening for a lot of people who didn't realize how prevalent that was. Now these were the only two that actually are made by the companies you think they are, Theo and uh, Madacas, and they used to have somebody else co-pack for them. They don't anymore, but the, they own their own facility. Theo's, they have a fun uh, tour in Seattle, done that a few times. So that sheds some light on it. Um, yeah, so maybe nine different companies around the world make almost everyone's chocolate. I just learned another interesting one. If you, so a friend of mine sends me a, a picture in Brazil and it has Donald Trump, 45th president of the United States on this chocolate bar. Anytime you see in an airport some type of funny packaged chocolate bar, apparently that's done by a company called Astor and they're in New Jersey and Astor buys chocolate from 
Belgium. And so let's, let's go back to this point. What is Belgian chocolate or what is Swiss chocolate? The cacao doesn't grow there. It's made in Belgium, in Belgium. It's made in Switzerland. Is that what makes it Swiss? Is that what makes it Belgium? And Hawaii. So if we're making chocolate in Hawaii, is it Hawaiian chocolate? I don't really see it that way. So that's why we like to clearly label everything. And this is one way you can tell who's actually making your chocolate is by the labeling. We find that anyone who's actually making their chocolate has a lot of videos and pictures of them processing it. If you don't see anything on, say, somebody's Instagram feed of them processing it into chocolate, chances are they're not making chocolate. So I'm shocked as I go to these shows, to tie it back to the very beginning, that all these foodie buyers come up and they're like, oh, we carry these local brands that are making chocolate. And I have to do my best to explain to them they're not actually making chocolate, they're confectioners, which is great. That's a wonderful part of our industry, but they're not making chocolate, they're buying chocolate from a chocolate maker. Usually, there's only a few that they would be purchasing from. So hopefully this sheds some light on this issue. Cheers and happy chocolate making.